vision for classical music is that it be a special and personal part of everyone's life, regardless of age, regardless of demographic, and especially regardless of cultural background. And where we can honor the abundant talent of Black and Latinx classical musicians and give them the opportunities that they so richly deserve. Be able to share classical music with uh, all types of people who would not normally uh, have access to it. I would love to see our culture become more artistically literate and be supportive and appreciative of contemporary artists and living composers. It's also an exciting challenge to find new, unexpected ways to be emotionally relevant with works from hundreds of years ago. I would love to see more women conducting more women in leadership in classical music. But more importantly than all of that, I would love for classical music to become something where we capture more of the emotion and more of the spirit of the music with less of a focus on perfection, more of a human element. For every door that you open, the universe will open five more. So get to it. Good evening. Well, it was May 2011. I'm sitting on my couch, stressed out, clutching the remote, glued to CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. I'm holding my breath, waiting for the Republicans in Congress to vote to extend my unemployment benefits. Now, I had been unemployed on and off since 2009, and it was rough, so rough that I'm surrounded by boxes because I've got to move out of my loft of nine years in Detroit into a bedroom in my sister's house in the suburbs of Southfield. Now, it's not my fault that Wall Street crashed and Too Big to Fail failed, yet here I am trying to figure out how to pay for the storage unit and the U-Haul truck. And I got to listen to these filibustering knuckleheads label me a 99er, lazy, don't want to work. <laughs> they call it me lazy when they're getting ready to take a break from doing nothing from the last time they took a break from doing nothing. <laughs> don't want to work. <laughs> I've worked hard all my life, as did my mother and her mother and her mother and her mother before that. I paid my taxes and my dues. I earned those benefits. Google me. And these good old boys suited up are holding my rent hostage, messing with my American dream, playing politics in their little scheme to extend the Bush tax cuts to the wealthy. Oh, hell no. I'm on my feet, screaming at the top of my lungs. Vote, you constipated mitches. <laughs> And when I heard myself screaming at the TV, pointing my fingers at a Congress who could care less and can't hear me, I vowed I would never allow Congress or anyone else to dictate my life, my liberty, and the pursuit of my happiness. I vowed that I would do what I love to do for the rest of my life, no matter what. No matter what, no matter what, now, I was terrified of my uncertain future when I moved into that bedroom in my sister's house. But little did I know that my life would completely change three months later when I would meet the Moth at a story slam in Detroit. Now, the Moth is an organization in New York dedicated to the art and craft of storytelling. I love stories. I'm a storyteller. I come from a long line of storytellers, old, uneducated black ladies from the Alabama, Mississippi, Jim Crow South. They use storytelling to teach, 
to warn, to entertain, to impart. They were masters. They could make going to the corner store sound like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I could only hope to aspire to their greatness. But I threw my name in the hat, and I won. The next thing I know, I'm telling a story at the, Phil, uh, the Fillmore Theater in Detroit. I'm flying around the country telling stories. I was hosted the seasonal opener in New York at the Players. I shared the same stage at the Hudson Theater with Adam Gopnik, Richard Price, and Garrison Keillor. My story airs on NPR. People from all over the world are emailing me, thanking me for telling my story like it's a service. And then one night, I'm standing in front of a sold out crowd of 900 people in Boston. I'm telling my story. It had taken six long years for me to crawl back from the numb of hell and the devastating grief over losing my mother to ovarian cancer in 2005. And nine months later, my son died from a massive seizure, the result of a brain injury he suffered from a car crash just a few years before. I was a dead woman walking. My future looked like a joyless chore to live. And then I noticed that I could hear a pin drop. The audience was breathing with me, leaning forward, waiting for my next word. And I was struck by the fact that I had never been listened to so profoundly, heard to such a degree. And the space between my telling and their listening, I felt like anything was possible. I felt free, I felt love, I felt whole and complete on my way to healing. And after I finished telling my story, they applauded my struggles and my overcoming. And I thought to myself, every single human being on the planet Earth should have this experience of being listened to and heard. And that's when I realized this is my calling, this is my purpose, this is what I'm supposed to do. But by now, I'm living in the basement of a friend's house in Ferndale. And one morning, I'm sitting in her garden, and I'm thinking, if storytelling set me on the path of healing, could it do the same for the city of Detroit? Because Detroit was grieving. Detroit had been grieving for years, lost lots of lives and health and wealth, loss of integrity, loss of the freedom of democracy, water shutoffs, lead poisoning, all kind of assaults and injustices on its citizens. And when I heard the news report, only 17% of Detroiters got out to vote today. I tried to remember, did I vote the year my mother and son passed? As I recall, I could barely get out of bed. And that's when the idea of the secret society of twisted storytellers came to me, the vision. I would use storytelling with the intention of connecting the city of Detroit healing and uplifting the spirits of the people who live here. And then out of their healing, they would transform, become leaders, go back into their communities, make a difference, be of service. Oh, the idea was so delicious, but I didn't have any money. But the idea was so delicious. The vision was so profound that I sold tickets to family and friends and rented a funky little 45-seat theater in downtown Detroit. It was a sellout. And the four storytellers that evening got a standing ovation, and I'm beaming like a proud mother, wondering, could this little social experience meant work? Well, we did pop-ups for the next eight months until we found a home at the Charles Wright Museum of African American History. And in 2013, we got a Night Arts Challenge grant, and I began to think bigger. If this could do the city of, do storytelling could do this for the city of Detroit, what about the world? Now, I moved into a dilapidated neighborhood in Detroit. It looked like apocalypse now on steroids. <laughs> and then one morning, I saw gentrification jogging through the streets of my neighborhood. <laughs> Her blonde ponytail swinging in the sunshine. <laughs> and I was overwhelmed with this false sense of security. But it gave me hope. And in 2014, 
We became a nonprofit 501c3 with a global mission to connect humanity, heal and transform community, and to provide an uplifting, thought-provoking, soul-cleansing entertainment experience through the art and craft of storytelling. In 2015, we brought George Clinton, music icon, to the Detroit Institute of Arts, a historic achievement. We brought the late, great Dick Gregory to our stage. In 2016, Dr. George Faison, renowned choreographer for the Wiz on Broadway and Alien, many other projects. We brought Detroit poet laureate Naomi Long Magic to our stage, LGBTQ, Latinx, ministers, state representatives, state senators, you name it, they were on our stage imparting knowledge to the audience. In 2017, I was named a Kresge Literary Arts Fellow, forging a whole new category, storytelling. And in 2018, I got an email from Mr. Joe Washington, a peacekeeper with the United Nations. He was asking, could I come to Utrecht, Netherlands, and install the Europe edition of the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers to address issues of racism, give a voice to the Syrian refugees and others who live there. And in 2019, we designed and facilitated storytelling workshops all over Detroit and beyond, in churches, at the Detroit Zoo, at Teen Height, everywhere. Now, vision continues to see. So in 2020, we're launching a global live streaming platform for our show on Binge Now. Anybody with a digital device in the whole world can download stories from people in Detroit and beyond. Storytelling is a vital and necessary component to the well-being and healing of any community and society. Storytelling, like organic fruits and vegetables, is organic therapy, connection, healing, transformation, and celebration of humanity. And the soul mate of the storyteller is a story listener. And the space between the two is magic. Anything is possible. And what I've learned over these eight years is that listening is a generosity. It's a human kindness. Listening grants being to another's experience. It's a service. Listening is a revolutionary act. And at the highest level, listening is the possibility of love. So here I am, ladies and gentlemen, doing what I love to do for the rest of my life no matter what, and I thank you for your service in listening. I love you too, one story at a time. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Sphinx Connect 2020 Vision. Thank you, Satori Shakur of the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers for this beautiful way to lead us into this year's convening. Thank you also to the entire Sphinx team who has worked tirelessly to put the events of this week together, but especially I am going to ask all of you guys to make some serious noise for the woman who not only plans and runs Sphinx Connect, but all of our leadership programs. Abigail Venman, show yourself. <laughs> Speaking of show, a little tribute to this year's theme of vision, don't think me a little too cheesy, I give you the human eye. <laughs> no, seriously. For a human eye, the light rays come into a sharp focusing point on our retina. The retina functions much like a film in a camera. 
It receives the image through the eye's internal lens and transforms this image into electrical impulses that are then carried by the optic nerve into our brain. Physically and conceptually, we see and we, what we're able to comprehend, interpret, and capture. We envision a picture of excellence, of success, of representation, only to the extent that our conscious minds are able to permit us. But the wonderful thing about the human mind and spirit is that we are capable of evolving our vision and exceeding our own capacity to dream. Some of our visions are expedited by the urgency of what we know must change now. Some of what we see and carry out through our work ends up becoming a vision of success, but it starts from necessity. We invent solutions, we birth ideas that may come from nothing. We push forward, at times propelled by very little more than hope. So on this balmy February day in our hometown of Detroit, I can honestly say that our reality is stronger than any vision that I would have personally been able to comprehend nearly a quarter of a century ago when Sphinx was birthed. In Flint, Michigan, where people are still challenged to have regular access to safe water, our teaching artists make sure that children in all public elementary schools receive the highest quality of music education. Our preparatory programs are hosted by the world's greatest conservatories, including Juilliard, Cleveland, and Curtis Institutes of Music. And instead of two orchestral partners of our inaugural year, with the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and in partnership with the League of American Orchestras and the New World Symphony, 74 of American orchestras have taken the initiative to directly invest their own financial and human resources in our artists through auditions, mentorship, and training support. In less than two years, this network increased by 95% in its membership. In the, in the next three years, Sphinx will invest more than $4 million in artist and organizational grants, working with more than 100 of our partners to continue to evolve that mission. Our touring Sphinx Virtuosi will extend their season into the winter and spring, now returning to Carnegie Hall and several other communities for encore performances. But I stand amidst all of you our community in the position of the greatest privilege. And I caution myself out loud, lest we think that we've actually arrived. In a recent series of conversations with some esteemed presenting colleagues of mine, I received a compliment of clever programming. Naturally elated, I was ready to go for a happy dance. Nobody was seeing me, it was by phone only to hear that their only hesitation is the lack of any well-known names on my program, and might I be there to discuss this challenge to sell our important mutual work to their classical audiences. Needless to say, I accepted the challenge gladly. Our artists are making headway into the ranks of orchestras and administrative leadership posts. But the question about credentials and experience, as well as the sanctity of artistic excellence, comes up enough to be a sobering reminder that we have yet got a long way to travel. For the record, the classical canon is not going to change until we change it. So clever or not, we need to insist on going for it with our programming, even when and if it feels uncomfortable or unfamiliar. Credentials are not going to appear magically on the page until we create opportunities for our leaders. And artistic excellence is simply not something that is defined by demographics or color or zip codes. And I have more than 700 alumni to prove that. So as we delve into our time of learning, community building and fellowship, I am asking all of us to contemplate one singular idea. Well, you can do more, but I'm going to ask for one, and that is why me?
In our line of work, we are so used to the next program, the next initiative, based on next funder guideline, priority, alignment, the in terminology like DEI. But I'm proposing that we temporarily set aside all of our 50-page strategic plans and volumes of our 10-point solution white papers and consensus building modules and all of that. Our eyes see what they're able to interpret. Our mind envisions only what we allow it to. So ask yourself why you're here. To borrow from an amazing author, Simon Sinek, in 1963, Dr. King's speech was not, I've got a strategic plan. <laughs> it was about a dream. And the reason that people came was not because they invested in a strong direct mail campaign or social media strategies. They probably didn't even hire a publicist. But most importantly, people came because they wanted to do their part. They needed to be there for themselves. So I'm saying consider being here for yourself. Consider making it your business to work more decisively in this sphere that we now popularly call DEI. Until each of us is dreaming with utmost clarity that representation is something that we personally need to change up for our own sake, for our own betterment, we're not going to move past the rhetoric. Let us ask ourselves why a well-represented field is best for each of us personally, so that this vision that we're hoping to evolve is not effective. It is not only effective, but it endures well past our time together this week. Some say that vision is a journey, but I posit today that it is a destination. And I'm fairly certain that our artists, our children, and those to whom we're leaving this world are quite ready for all of us to arrive. And now I have the greatest honor of telling you about two people whom I admire ardently and who have also agreed to share their vision with us. Michael Abels, our plenary feature, is an acclaimed composer commissioned by dozens of orchestras across the country and known for his works such as Global Warming, Delights and Dances, and Urban Legend, along with choral pieces such as Be the Change and Limitless. The Houston Chronicle spoke of his keen ear for musical color and a deft ability to adapt structural elements from popular music into the symphonic idiom. While originally regarded as a brilliant classical music composer who integrated other American idioms in his material, Michael's most recent collaborations with Jordan Peele have led him to compose music for award-winning films like Us and Get Out both of which garnered multiple major nominations and winning titles in Hollywood Music and Media and World Soundtrack Awards, among several others. He also scored Spike Lee's latest sci-fi film, See You Yesterday and Bad Education, which recently premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, as well as the Netflix feature All Day and a Night. Here to help us learn Michael's story is Rochelle Riley, who is a national treasure and Detroit's most distinguished leading voice in the arts. She is the Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Detroit, as well as a nationally celebrated author, journalist, and essayist. As an advocate for culture, youth education, and race relations, she served as a columnist for the Detroit Free Press for, Free Press for nearly 20 years. She authored The Burden, African Americans and the Enduring Impact of Slavery, and is a co-founder of Letters to Black Girls, a project that grew from a single presentation to a national mission to pass words of encouragement from black women to girls. She has won numerous awards, including the Ida B. Wells National Association of Black Journalists Award for her outstanding efforts to make newsrooms and news coverage more accurately reflect the diversity in the communities they serve. An inductee into the Michigan Journalism Hall of Fame, Rochelle is a luminary who has dedicated her life's work to further the issues of justice, equity, and the importance of creative expression. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in offering a true Detroit welcome to Rochelle Riley and Michael Abels.
Hey. Hello. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Great, great. Well, I can tell you that uh, I am a huge fan and I'm very excited to be able to have this conversation with Michael. Um, as you all know, I have a 16-year-old uh, dog named Desi and he has a babysitter every time I leave. And the babysitter tonight said, oh my God, you get to interview the most amazing people. Please tell him I said hello. <laughs> so Blake says hello. Hey, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to do is start a little bit um, of, of the beginnings and how a young boy on a South Dakota farm became a genius in Hollywood. But I want to start by asking you to tell us about your very first composition, how it came about. Oh, well, let's see. So I, um, my first musical memory was of, of uh, um, you know, of Edvard Grieg's In the Hall of the Mountain King. And the reason I know this is because my grandmother had a record that played this. And this is a piece of music, if you haven't heard this, but basically the story is the two kids go up into the fjord and they meet the monster and he chases them out. And the music is terrifying. And I was, and I was, I must have been maybe two, but it just scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and it's kind of ironic considering what I do now is my job is to give back, right? And to get, get back. Um, but the, but then it was Rodgers and Hammerstein and uh, Do Re Mi and One Word for Every Note by mixing it up like this. And I thought, well, what a fun game that is, right? You get to make music by mixing. It's like a puzzle that you need to figure out and you can touch people. And that just to me I thought, well, what a, great, what a great thing to try to do. So I tried to write music in, in grade school and I got frustrated. I didn't know what would come next. So I gave up. But then uh, in high school, I wrote a piece and I got to that point where you don't know and I thought, well, you know, just be patient and it'll come. And, uh, and I worked it out. So, uh, so then after that, the, then the idea of, you know, when you face a challenge and then you're able to get through it, then I thought, okay, I think I can do this, so. Wow. High school, young boy, all of this stuff happened for you so soon and now you've done uh, this musical collaboration with Jordan Peele on Get Out which scared the heck out of me. Thank you. <laughs> and, and us. Um, t talk a little bit about uh, sort of the journey from all of these different musical genres that you know and that you are known for as this acclaimed, you know, classical, gospel, bluegrass. I mean, you do it all. You, you, you're conversant in so many different genres. How, how, did you, how did you come to collaborate with Jordan Peele on these two amazing films? Well, so I, so I was... Um, I've always been interested, like I've talked about music being a puzzle to me, and, right? Melissa. <laughs> uh, I had her work with me on Us. So if you've seen Us, you've heard, there's violin solos, some of them are Melissa, so. Um, I, so I've always been fascinated by why one genre sounds the way that it does and what makes it different from this other, and so I always thought, well, if you wanna know the answer, write some. Right, right in that genre, and you will, you will know. <laughs> if you can do it, it shows that you know. So I've, I always thought it was interesting to write in different genres. Um, and among my concert works were commissions by the Sphinx organization, um, Delights and Dances, and another one's called Urban Legends. And they are, um, they're on YouTube, like things are, and where they had dozens of hits, you know, like tens and twenties of hits. One of them was Jordan Peele who was at the time known as a, a, for Key and Peele, and no one knew that he was really a horror aficionado and had seen every horror and suspense film ever, and that he was directing a film, and, um, and he was looking for a composer. Now, there are lots of Hollywood film composers, way more qualified than me, with a longer resume. But what he saw when he looked at a Sphinx video was he saw an entirely black and Latinx orchestra. And he, right? Thanks. And he saw a composer who was mixed race like him. And he was telling a story about a very dark skinned black man in a white world. And I think he thought, there's someone who maybe could understand my lead character. Now, he didn't tell me this, but what he said to me in our first meeting is he said, You know, I want the African American voice in this film 
both literally and metaphorically. But at, he said, but the thing about African American music is it's, there's always a thread of hope running through it. And I had never thought of that before. I thought, what a smart thing to say, right? Even in the blues, because there's this, I, there's this understanding that's never said that, is, that I understand your pain, right? In the blues, like that's what makes that touch people. And so he said this about African American music, and then he said immediately, but you gotta drain the hope right out of it. <laughs> oh, wow. And so I said, I think what you're talking about is like gospel horror. <laughs> and, and neither one of us knew what that sounded like, but we liked the idea of those two words together. You know, like that sounds like a cool thing. So, um, so I went home and I wrote him some demo, a couple demos of what gospel horror would sound like. And one of them was uh, a piece called Siki Lisa Kwawahenga, which ended up being the uh, main title for Get Out. So that was the beginning of our collaboration. But it started through a connection of him seeing my work here at Sphinx. See, look at how Sphinx is working all the time, all the time. So for the young people in the audience, can you talk a little bit about being a young person and whether you could envision what your life is like now or whether that was what you thought would happen or whether you saw something entirely different? Yeah, you know, this, I, especially with the two speakers we've just seen, um, this helped crystallize, I hope, what I would want to say about that, which is that, you know, I grew up admiring, you know, obviously Rodgers and Hammerstein from when I was a little kid. Um, film music, John Williams, you know, his, his musical palette is unsurpassed. And Quincy Jones, oh my gosh. I would take those Michael Jackson records and slow them down to try to hear the, you know, the production because that's all Quincy Jones. And it just like, how does he make the groove like that, you know? So, uh, and, so and, and to, for harmony, you know, Elton John songs, I'm a, I'm a pianist, and I would be like, how, what is that chord change? And, 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 and so I had imagined myself, of course you look at those, you, met, you admire their music, and so you think, well, I wanna, I wanna do that or be like that. And so if you think about that, I haven't succeeded at any one of those. <laughs> but the beauty is, on the way to be inspired by those people, I ended up finding who I am, what my voice is. And I think that that's what, so th how that relates to vision is that you, it, most of us, even though we're creative people, very creative people and we can dream big, we are sometimes limited by that which we've seen. And, and we think, well, I don't want to limit my vision, but the thing is you don't always realize <laughs> that, you, know, you, that you don't see what blinders you might have on because you have them on. You know, you have to, and it's, it's other people who can get, get them off of you because they're not wearing them. Does that make any sense? That does make sense. So, so what that means is that in your vision, it's important to have direction and, and go to a destination, like Afa just said. But also, sometimes you don't know what the destination is. And you have to be willing to, be, to look around and go, oh, I'm here. <laughs> when it wasn't maybe the, the place that you set off for. But you have to know when you've gotten to that place. You have to see what the universe, the universe wants your talents but it may not want the exact ones that you want to offer it in that order. And you don't always get to choose. Your job is to offer them up and let the universe select the things that it needs from you because it will if you only offer. Wow. <laughs> so, some compose by hearing the notes, and some compose by feeling, uh, you know, composing from the heart, and some compose from their gut. Is there something that describes you? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, you can tell that because I think of music as a puzzle, there's a little bit of a scientist in me, like, oh, that's it, you know, what can I do with this and that? And so that's an important part of my art. Um, part, of being, part of being an artist is that you, you have to know what you're good at. It's not just, well, I want to express myself. Well, what is that, you know, what are you good at expressing and what are you not good at expressing? You should have a sense of that because that's both shows you areas in which you could develop and areas that are like, this is my thing, this is what I do. And you don't always have to know that at the beginning. It took me till about, when I wrote the piece Global Warming, I was about 28. And that, 
was, that was the first piece I wrote where I thought, okay, I get me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so if you're not yet 28 and you think, it took you till 28? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's a process. And the beauty is, also as an artist, you keep, to, you keep getting to discover who you are. And with luck, you'll keep discovering that through your whole life. And that's a huge blessing. And in, in the best world, I would bridge back to your original question and make it sound like I remembered what you said. But I may have lost the thread. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like, am I do I write from the gut? I got yeah, it, right. From the so, gut. <laughs> so the best music you write, this is the frustrating thing with all the training you do and all the, every, all the technical stuff. The best music always feels like you didn't write it, but that you just channeled it and you were the real, only just the first person to hear it and the person who got to explain it. And that music comes, but... You, you have to be, first you have to be present and willing to let it come, which is about listening. Like, so, <laughs> it's not just listening to other people, it's listening to the committee that's in charge of the creativity. Wow. So that's one thing. The other thing though is that you also have to be, it's not, you're not just powerless. It's really kind of a, you're a channel, but you have, but it's also, they don't give you all the, they don't give you all the information. <laughs> you can tell I'm a little bitter. <laughs> about that. They don't give you everything. They give you a little piece and then they go. And then it's up to you to work with that. So you, you, you also have to write from your, you have to write from your skill and you have to, you have to instinctually wait. So that's a long answer, but you can figure out which of those I fall under. I liked all of that. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> so this is one of those questions, you know, you get to a certain age and people want to ask you to reflect and to look back. You're not there yet, but I still want you to look back. Is there a favorite uh, time period in your life as a composer that you think, oh, that was, that was my moment, that was the God. spot? Well, uh, it, it's mostly about the experiences I had during creating that work, I think, that would make it, or, the, or whether, whether that, I feel like that work was, the people get, it, it's great when people get the work and understand what it is, you know, so, um, Delights and Dances was a great experience for me. Um, but then, th there's, so there's so many different choices. I mean, Get Out was an amazing experience. Us was an amazing experience. Um, just yesterday, we premiered a, a ballet for concert band um, at, on, on a, the theme of social justice at Butler University. And it, I worked with a, got to work with a choreographer, and. I was just like, I am so happy and grateful for my life. It turned out so well, you know? And so that was, yesterday's experience <laughs> was a peak experience. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I've been at this long enough to appreciate my, I hope I appreciate my blessings. I feel very blessed. So, anyway. Now that you've done all of these different genres and you've shown that you can do lots of things, once you've done Get Out and Us, are you now a gospel horror <laughs> Composer, is that well, going to be what you do? <laughs> well, uh, it's one of the things I do, but I, I've so far I've enjoyed genre busting, and I'm <laughs> gonna I'm gonna continue as long as anyone lets me. I mean, but for example, the ballet it has it has some hip hop in it, but it's not all it's it's for concert bands, so figure that out, right? Yeah. So hopefully that's another one more genre that's been expanded, and um, I'm writing a piece for Kronos Quartet and choir, and that's a huge honor and I'm co-writing an I'm co-writing an opera with Rhiannon Giddens mm. who's this amazing who wow. people think of as a folk artist but they don't even she's just the most talented person so um, so all these different genres that I one of the things I feel like I do or I certainly enjoy is expanding genres so to the extent that people keep giving me opportunities to do that whether it's in film or the concert hall I'm, those are the things I'm going to be a yes for. Now, uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, who works with John Williams a lot, said that Jordan Peele should work with you a lot, that he would be, you know, what John Williams has been to him, which was pretty amazing. Thank you, Mr. Spielberg, very, <laughs> very, very much. Are you and Jordan already talking about doing something else that you can talk about? Well, so, so Jordan, <laughs> you know, so Jor Jordan is one of those hyper-talented Hollywood people who is into, who can do everything and is doing everything. And so one of the things he's doing is producing. 
And in doing that, he's actually, I mean, not only is he, you know, making a nice living, but he's also <laughs> able to employ and pay it forward and um, give opportunities of, to other voices who haven't been heard to tell their stories. So among the things he's doing, he's producing, a sh he produced, he rebooted Twilight Zone for CBS All Access. He has a show called Lovecraft Country that's gonna be on HBO if it isn't already. Um, he re he um, did a new version of Candyman, which is a um, horror film from the- Another one I will not <laughs> no, see. No, you would never see, right? So Jordan, <laughs> Jordan loves Candyman, because that's his thing. So he redid it, but then he had got another director to do that, and that's gonna be coming out. And I haven't been a part of those projects. I th and, but I've let him know that, you know, it, it, as if he would need me to tell him that when he calls, I'm there, right? And so I think he, he, I think he puts special pride in the pieces that he both writes and directs, and so far that's only Get Out and Us. And I know that he won't want to, I know he has no in interest in like doing Get Out 2 or anything like, he wants to do something fresh, yeah. but up to that standard. And so I think if he, decides he wants to do that, I think he'll call me, but I, I don't know how long that'll be, so. <laughs> Jordan, call him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so everybody has uh, some moment or something or, or something that they look to and they attribute. That's one of the things that really was sort of the basis for my success. For me as a writer, I wrote every column for my grandmother, not to her, but just with her in mind, because if I could explain whatever I was writing about to her, then I could explain it to anyone. Is there one thing in your life that you look to and attribute your success to that, your success in life, your success as a composer, as a musician? Well, I feel like I, first of all, there's a huge element of luck, just like real luck. And, and, may, and you could and attribute that to a higher power, you know, and that, but there's, there, I think it's, I think it's unfair to people when they're, they're, they get the message that if they don't achieve their ultimate dream that they somehow it's their fault. You know, when I, I, I and people need to be encouraged to, you know, think in possibility and, and, and opportunity and be a yes to life. But there's also, there, there, things come your way that you don't expect and it's, it's about how you deal with those things that turn out, that affect your happiness but when people have success beyond their dreams, often there's an element of just kismet. And so I don't want to take credit for things that, that were, I was very fortunate for. So that, that's part of it. But the other part, I think, is, is, reacting to, is reacting to situations in a way that is making the most of a situation I'm in. And, he, and, and because I enjoy... Um, because I enjoy different musical collaborations, I'm open to giving them a shot and seeing what could happen, you know? And I think I know what, like, like I said, I think I've thought a lot about what I think I do best, so therefore I have a, I know that I, I know that I have a sense of what I think good music is. And for a composer that matters, because every day you write three notes, you need to know if they're working or not. And so you have to have a real sense of what's happening. And so even when other people disagree with me, <laughs> like in large numbers, <laughs> um, I, I had a stick to that said, you know, I know, this, I know this is valuable and so I'm not gonna give up because I just know this is valuable and I have trained myself to know that and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how much public acknowledgement I get from that if it feels good to this, this sense that I've trained. So I'm hoping that you young people are listening and you greet success wherever it comes to you. I'm so glad you said that. So of course people want to know until Jordan calls, and he will, um, what's next for you? What are you working on now? Well, I have, the, I have those, um, the, the Kronos piece and the opera are, are <laughs> coming soon, so <laughs> I've, been, I've been working on that, and I have, uh, I think Afa mentioned that I have, there's a movie called Bad Education on HBO that's coming out in April, and that's a, it's an interesting, it stars Hugh Jackman, but he plays a school administrator. Oh, wow. <laughs> and there's no, nothing ever emerges from his, <laughs> from his the hands. back of his hand, no. 
And, and it's, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, it's a dark comedy. Um, and because that's a real, uh, it's not a Jordan Peele movie. <laughs> Number one, it's not a horror movie, but it's, and yet it's, um, and the, the score required very legit classical music. Um, and so that's what ultimately they decided that, uh, that to give me a shot with that one. It's because I showed them that I, they wanted it to sound like one of the great composers that I think I could pull that off. And um, so you can see that just because it's different and unusual challenge and, 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 and good projects that I think are interesting to tell people about, those are the sort of things that I love. So th that's what's, and then after that, I'm very open and excited about what's gonna happen and I don't know. Okay, open to possibility. Absolutely. So we've got all these young people in the audience and we've got some people who are not so young who like good advice. Um, if you had one piece of advice you could give our audience, what would it be? Whether it's about life or about creating or about vision. And, and besides what I've said, I guess the only thing would be just that, you know, in, in education in general these days, one of the challenges is that people are, our job is to, and, and I taught at a, I, I should tell you, I taught at a, I ran the music department of a private high school or a private K through 12 school for 11 years. So, and part of our challenge is we're training people for jobs that may not have been invented yet. I mean, just think of when you were in grade school and some of the things that people are doing now. So how do you, you the important thing is we acknowledge that and say the skills that you're learning may be in a job that, you're, that doesn't even have a job description yet. And so how does that apply to us? Is that it, that's about the thing of that you're, if you're a rigorously training musician, you're, you really have, a, you have a huge program every day and every week, and you also have a vision of where that's gonna take you. And I would just say that, keep in mind this thing about how we don't know even what jobs and what ways to succeed and find your, find your, um, find your bliss are in life because the world is changing so fast. And so take the skills that you have and be willing to apply them to anything and see what you can get that you can apply in other ways. Not because you're not a musician or not going to be a musician, but because that's really just how you enhance your experience in life and how you offer it up to, up to the universe so that the universe can use your skills and you can find the right place for what it is that you have to give. That's beautiful. Thank you. So I knew from the time I was eight years old what I wanted to be when I grew up and what I wanted to do. So when people would ask me this question, there, there was no alternative. But if you had not been musical genius composer, what else might you have been? Well, I have some of those things I've already been. <laughs> <laughs> so one of them was an educator, which right. uh, we, was, is really a chance to, I remember, you know, we all remember teachers in our lives who said something on a certain day and we felt a certain way and there was just something in that thing, you know? And that day was in that teacher's life, probably just a regular day. <laughs> but so on d days of teaching that were bad for me, I would tell myself, you know, you don't know. This might have been the day that that person got something they needed. So that was great. And I also used to um, um, help plan multi-day bicycle tours across the country. You're kidding. No. <laughs> and it was really, it was amazing. It was amazing and wonderful. <laughs> you rode across the country. Well, you never do so little biking as when you're planning a bicycle tour. <laughs> if you want to be a bicyclist, do not plan bicycle tours. Um, but I had been a bicyclist, and so that made me think that I knew what the good route was. And, uh, and, um, and so before long, that we, we were doing this fundraising bicycling tour, and they needed people, and I was doing that. And so, it, see, this is an example, hopefully, from what I was telling you about. So fast forward a very short period of time, and I'm actually working at, with, for this thing, and we have to plan a bicycle tour. And uh, it was, it, believe it or not, and people would say, was that your full-time job? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> even in like January? Like, yes, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and, but it was really, it was, it was exciting and rewarding, and, and we, because we were, we were fundraising, this was back when AIDS was a death sentence, 
Um, so it was, it was bicycle touring with a specific cause to make a difference in the world. And some of the riders had never been on a bicycle in their lives, but they were just motivated, you know? And so um, because of the inspiring element of it and the chance to give back and the, and the organizational skills that composing for orchestra music, it's an organized plan. So to me, it was like, oh, I know, this is like, or, this is like orchestration. <laughs> like, the oboes have to do this while the violins have a page turn. Composing on right, wheels. You know, and you're like, you, yeah. yeah. It's, so to me, it related to that part of my brain. So it was actually a lot of fun and rewarding. I was making a difference in the world. So maybe, well, I'll, maybe someday I will again be a bicycle tour. And I would take that tour. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to be sure and tell the audience the same thing I told you at the beginning. I am a huge fan of the thank Us you so soundtrack. Much. Thank I will you. never see the film. <laughs> the music scared me to death. So when you've done that, you know you've done your job. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Abels. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have a very special treat for you because of course he's here so you would like to hear some of his music and we had someone, yes, yes, oh, and we had someone wonderful who was going to actually be here to perform on stage but Laura Downs is under the weather. Um, so what we're going to do is show you that but I'd like you, Michael, to talk a little bit about this piece of music that you wrote and how this came about. Okay, so, so Laura is, she's an amazing artist. She, she actually uses her art to address social justice. And she does it by doing, I mean, and this is, these aren't her words, this is my interpretation of her work. So you should check out her work because she has various CDs and each one is kind of around a social justice theme, but it's also around collaborating just with people she loves. So just to give you an idea of how to think out of the box and use your, creative, your, your art. So this album was about a Leonard Bernstein. It's called For Lenny, Lenny's uh, centenary, centennial a few years ago. And so she asked composers to write pieces in honor of, of Bernstein, and she played some of Bernstein's anniversaries, which are tributes that he wrote um, for other people in his life. And so I never got to meet Bernstein, um, but I got to at least see him conduct, and I got to see him at a rehearsal. And he also came to prominence when he did these um, appearances on, on PBS or on TV way back in the black and white days. And he was able to talk to people about classical music in a way that was relatable. And at that time, there weren't a lot of people who could do that. There was maybe nobody else. And so this was one of the things that he became known for, is just relatability. And I always, he always struck me as this, I remember him, not that I was young when he was young, but I remember him being young and how he was this guy who would just like, he's one of those stars, like he walks in the room and everybody's focused on him, right? And he's like, when the party starts is when Lenny comes in. And he was quite, uh, quite, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Just like, he, he, was, he, was a, he was a peacock. He was, he was that type of person, you know? So I thought, well, a piece about Lenny has to display that, you know, kind of a bravura energy about it. And also he had a certain style. And, you know, I'm the person who loves to write in genres, right? So I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to write a piece that sounds like Bernstein, sort of, you know, because I think that I would know how to do that. So with all that explanation... <laughs> There's a piece that's maybe smaller than the explanation, but <laughs> it's a piece called Iconoclasm, and it's in honor of Bernstein.
Oh my God, that was spot on. Tribute without being duplicative. That was oh, fantastic. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, now it's your turn. It's time for us to take questions from the audience for Mr. Abels. Um, and I'm hoping that a lot of young people are going to jump right in, pretend you're journalists, and <laughs> don't be shy. There's a mic over here. There's a mic over here. I'm going to go back and forth. We're also going to have some Slido questions. So jump right up. Yes, about Slido, you can log on to slido.com and put in the code SphinxConnect to submit your questions. And so this is from Slido. Okay. Um, what was the reason for choosing Swahili out of all African languages to write the main song of Get Out? That's a great question. So I had, I, through research I discovered that Swahili wasn't the primary language of slaves, of, of people who were enslaved. Um, but Swahili is a very musical language, and I needed a little artistic license. <laughs> uh, the reason I, but, the re, but why write in Swahili or any other language at all? The reason is because the voices in Sikiliza Kwa Wahenga are supposed to be voices of departed slaves or lynching victims trying to warn Chris, the lead character, to get out. But, you know, ghosts don't speak to us they don't tell us what they're, they, they speak to us in dreams and metaphors. And so to just have them sp say in English, hey, Chris, get out, was not, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> Plus, we'll spoil the movie because it happens at the beginning, so there's that. So Swahili seemed perfect because it would sound African, right? And I used African-American voices who sounded African-American. It was all important. So what you hear is you hear, and the first word in it is brother because when one black person says that to another, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, right? And so I thought, one word and I can communicate, everyone in the audience will know who's speaking and who they're talking to. And then it says, brother, siki liza kwa wahenga, which means listen to the ancestors. Kimbia, run. <laughs> Una kimbia mbali, run far away. Uh, siki liza kwa ukweli, listen to the truth. Um, and then kua koa mwenyewe, which means save yourself. Thank you. Well, we can take another Slido question if you got, oh, there are people coming, but why don't we take one while we're uh, getting people to the mic? Has your family always uh, supported your music career? Oh, that's a great question. So, yes. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm really blessed in that, that they were, they didn't know, and they weren't from, I didn't come from a musical family particularly. Um, my story is similar to Obama's in that I am mixed race. I was raised by the white side of my family, which is how I got on a, you may have wondered, you may have heard about the farm in South Dakota. <laughs> right, so that's how I was there. I was the darkest person in South Dakota. And, you know, but that made me unafraid to be the darkest person in the room, which in concert music I found myself being a lot, but I was just used to that. So, um, uh, but, they, but they, even though they weren't musical, or they weren't musicians. In, in farmhouses, there was a spinet piano in every farmhouse. And what I got, the message I got as a little kid was like, well, playing, playing music is what people, you know, there's a television because people watch television. There's a piano because what people do is they make music. So it seemed totally natural to me that, I've, actually I thought I could play the piano at age two. I, could, I thought that I was, and it was only when I tried to play a specific song and it did, I couldn't play it, that that was a revelation to me that I wasn't all powerful. And so <laughs> I complained to my grandmother. I said, I, it does, this does not sound like the song. And it was do, re, mi, actually. So, and she said, well, you have to take lessons for it to sound. And I said, well, I want to take lessons. And I was four. But, um, but they got me lessons, uh, even though they didn't even live in anything that looked like a town. They would drive me into town for these lessons. And so they may have had questions when I got to college about, but what they saw was just how passionate about, I was about majoring in music. It was clear nothing else was gonna make me happy. So it may not have been a good idea, <laughs> but they respected me as a young person to let me, you know, let me make that choice and maybe I would regret it. <laughs> but they were, but I, I, compared to some parents, I feel like that was extremely supportive. And I really loved them for that. We'll go to this side. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming, being here with us. Absolutely. We appreciate it. 
Um, wondering if there's any pieces of your process as a composer um, that you've identified that help you get cl closer to maybe the flow state or like a deeper sense of knowing of when you compose um, past the technique, past the thinking of notes and more deeply into what it is you're trying to feel and express? Oh, great question. So I find that I'm really, you have to be willing when you have an idea or when you hear an idea, you know, I, I talked about channeling. You have to be willing to stop what you're doing and be present for it. And it's never at a convenient time. <laughs> but you have to stop and be present because, you know, that's required. So often that's early in the morning. And so I'll write, as I'm waking up, I have an idea. And then I know I have to get up and I have to go and play it or do something that will cause me to remember it. And I find that the, that the if I have a pure idea, a pure idea that was kind of handed to me, that I'm then able to take that with my knowledge and expand that, you know. So because I've learned that that's my process, I've, you know, I've, you know given it up, to, I've embraced that. Um, because th if I have really great ideas, they're gonna happen earlier in the day. The great ideas rarely come after I'm tired. So I actually delegate, like orchestration, if I'm writing an orchestra piece, I know that I have to kind of write it at first and then I can orchestrate it when I'm more tired because I've just noticed that that's a skill I can do when I'm not in that zone. Does that, does that, I yeah. hope that answers it. It does, thank you. We're gonna go to the other side of the room. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so first, I just have to say, Delights and Dances is one of my favorite pieces of all time. Thank you so much, really. And I'm curious, I hope this isn't a weird question, but I wanna know why did you rewrite it? Was it just for Sphinx for a different orchestration? Because I've actually played both versions, so oh, I'm wow. wondering which one do you prefer <laughs> and why, why would right. you tamper with the perfection the oh, first time? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's a great question, and thank you for being that kind. The motivation was Sphinx and Afa. I blame Afa. <laughs> I blame Afa. But do you know, but with that being said, I definitely preferred the second version, the all string version. And the reason is because, it's not because I didn't like the, the larger version or feel like it was successful, but it, there's just something about the vibe that the smaller group is able to provide for it. Yeah. And there's no, there's n the, the string orchestra is not gonna overwhelm the soloists. Whenever you're writing a concerto of any type, as a composer, you're constantly you know, uh, conductor friends of mine are saying playing a concerto for an orchestra means, you know, 30 minutes of mezzo piano because you can't cover the soloist, right? So to have a smaller orchestra, you can play mezzo forte, you know, like what, <laughs> what so, or even forte, and they can, and the, and the soloist can be heard, so that's a great thing about it. And, um, and it's really very stringistic music. So for that reason, I prefer the second version. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And now back over here to this side, hello. Hello. So I make my own, I'm a violinist, and I make my own hip hop instrumental, whatever genre that awesome. comes to mind. I, I, my question is, how, what do you suggest on how to get your music heard? Yeah, you know, so I'm the guy who, Jordan Peele called me when I was in my 50s. <laughs> so. I'm not the best, <laughs> like, why do people ask me? I clearly don't know. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> ask someone 30 who's got like 10 million, you know, Spotify, like, what? Um, but part of it is that, like there's more platforms than ever now to put your music out there. And I see, you know, my, my social feeds are filled all the time with people who are playing their music and they're doing that to get heard. And to, sometimes I listen to them, you know? And if, I, if, if someone really knocks me out, I'll, I'll hit like on that, you know, give them, <laughs> give them a little bit of... Um, and, and what did I, and I... Fortunately, I got to put urban legends on, on YouTube and get depressed over how many views it got. Well, look what that did for me, right? Imagine if I hadn't done that, you know? And so... My advice is not, I, I'm not giving you the advice that someone in, someone in marketing would give you. I mean, they, I feel like they would know and I wouldn't. Yeah. 
but I'm just telling you how I find, how I stumble on music. This is how I stumble on music, and you have to let people stumble on your music. If they have no chance to stumble on it, then they won't. But you gotta give them that chance, and, and be out there and talk about it. Because with the new technologies, you have more chance for people to, they, there used to be no way for people to do that, except to go to a club. Now they can just be, you know, sitting in their house on their phone, and they could stumble on your music. So take advantage of it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, let's take another Slido question. This one is popular. Could you please talk about how your mixed race identity has affected your career and life? Wow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, it, it's, it, my story is very unique to me. Maybe it's, maybe it is, maybe it's shared by other mixed race people, but I just feel like it was, because I was raised by the white side of my family, I'm used to being the darkest face in the room, right? And God bless my parents who said to me, you're very special and we love you very much. And they just, and they told me I was adopted from day one. They would, t my grandmother would sing me the story of how I was adopted while she changed my diaper. And, and she was not a composer. <laughs> but she did that so that being adopted would feel just organic to me, like it was totally normal. And it, it, you know, it moves me to think about the love of what that was. But anyway, because I just knew, well, I'm special and I'm different and I'm loved very much. So the fact that I was different, you know, and I, you know, I was teased and kids singled me out and all that stuff. But it, I didn't feel like, I, I, well, that was step one. And then step two was I didn't really, the, the drawback maybe was that I didn't really have a black community. And I didn't discover the black community until I moved to LA and went to USC. And, um, and so what I did was I thought, well, you know, music is the bridge, right? And so I went and I sang in a black church. And I sang in the choir. And I got to be the lightest face in the room for a change. And it was, you know, a very different experience for me. But I thought, well, I love music, and everybody here loves music, and so this, this is a home for me. And it was. And I was very, um, and I'm really bougie, right? I'm really bougie. And I love, <laughs> and I love, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do radio interviews, and people will ask me about diversity in Hollywood, and I'll tell them about things like that. And I thought, I know there are people driving in their car going, this who is this guy talking about <laughs> diversity? This is not a black guy. Um, so, but I found our community to be very welcoming, much as I found the Sphinx community to be very welcoming. And I was able to discover my own black identity to help myself kind of own my biracial identity. Um, and so that was a great journey for me, and I, and I, um, when I look back on it, I think, oh, you know, that was so, I didn't, I didn't have that much sense of what I was doing. It, I, the way I tell it, it makes it sound like I was that smart that I thought, well, I'll do this and then this will happen. And it wasn't like that. It was just, I was really just kind of seeking belonging and, and trying new things. And I loved gospel music, so I was gonna, you know, check that out at the source. And so all those things, um, but the real question was, how did it affect my music? Or was it how it affected my life? Both. Both, okay. So you could say in my music, well, look, he loves exploring different genres, and that's kind of like his racial identity. So that seems really, um, that seems to fit together beautifully. And that wasn't, it wasn't like I went, oh, I'm biracial, so therefore, you know, it makes it sound very smart. It wasn't like that. It was just like me expressing who I am in both in my life and in my, my um, cultural experience and in my music. But I think that the other way it's affected my music is that maybe, you know, there aren't many African-American composers. There are even less in Hollywood doing films. And perhaps some of the reason I didn't find some traction was due to the fact that I don't look like what the conventional composer looked like. However, I may not have ever met Jordan Peele if I didn't have the background that I have. And so maybe I was just born a little too early, maybe. And now I'm able to have opportunities that other people aren't, you know, don't even get to have. So, so it's, it's, been, 
it may have been a setback but it's, or, or something to overcome, but it's also been a huge blessing. Let's go to the other side of the room. Hello. 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 Hello, Mr. Abels. Hey. Uh, as a member of the Virtuosi, along with Meredith, thank you so much for arranging your various works for the Virtuosi over the past decade that you've been working with them, from delights and dances to global warming. It's thank been you. such an honor and a pleasure to play those and work with you. Well, um, I, I feel likewise. It's, it's, you're welcome. <laughs> um, you briefly mentioned earlier a, a theme of approachability and relevancy uh, in your work. How do you balance that when creating something from the ground up? Does that ever enter the conversation in your themes and your motifs, or do you kind of just go for natural complexity, or does that figure no, anywhere I, I, in the process? I feel like all music, regardless of concert music, film music, it's all storytelling. All music to me is storytelling. And it, a sonata form is storytelling. And it's just that it's a story that's built on structure because music kind of needs structure to, you know, to hang together. So, and, and also in, in the concert hall, the audience gets to make up the story. You're moved by the music, but the story that the music tells you is unique to you. And that's part of why we love the experience. So, there's, I think there's a, there's a relationship between a composer and the audience, or a performer and the audience. The audience entrusts the composer and performer to take them on a journey. You know, if you're in an audience, you're gonna, make, you're gonna be present and listen. You're saying, okay, I trust you, take me on a journey. As a performer or composer, at the end of that journey, you do not want the audience to regret that they trusted you. And when I'm in the audience and I think, wish that I had those two hours back, I'm angry. <laughs> and I, so I imagine when I'm the composer <laughs> that the people who feel gypped are angry. <laughs> so therefore, I'm going to do my best to make sure that you don't feel that way, that you feel like the time that you spent allowing me to take you on a journey was worth your time. And so to me, that is that is the definition of accessibility. The people are willing to go a lot of places. We love stories that take us places we've never been, right? We just want to know that the journey's going to be kind of worth it. And worth it could have a lot of definitions. But there still needs to be a journey. So if you set, you can be, your music can be as dissonant as you want. Like in, in urban legends, all hell breaks loose, like in the middle. But I bet if you, the thing, like what I tell young composers is that I should listen to your music, I should drop, I should just start anywhere in it, and within about 30 seconds, I should be able to guess where I am in the piece between the beginning and the ending. I should be able to guess pretty close. And if I can't, that's a problem, because I don't know that I'm on a journey. <laughs> or when I'm on a journey, but it may not have an ending <laughs> or something. So, uh, so that, to me, is accessibility. And because I'm always writing with that kind of perspective, I think that's what makes my music accessible. It's not about the harmonic language. It's about um, the sense that it's all going to, everything that I'm having to, having to listen to or put up with is going to pay off. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Let's head back over to the other side. Do you have a personal mission versus a professional mission? Gosh, these are great questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the short answer would be no. Like, you'd want them to be... And I think in a, in a life that you loved, they would seem the same. But you have, you have life outside of work, <laughs> even as a creative person. And you want those areas of your life to be rich and fulfilled. And so I have those goals as well. Um, no one can. One thing about being creative, for better or worse, is that every other part of your life that you don't have managed will instantly interfere with the creative part. <laughs> and it's very frustrating. <laughs> But this goes from everything, from, you know, like you, because of the thing, of you, you don't have enough money and you have to do things and that's going to somehow interfere with your creative life. Even not having your house clean, I'm sorry to tell you, will interfere with your creative life. And strangely, or maybe because I know this, the minute I really know I'm going to write something big, do you know what I do first? The house ends up being cleaned from top to bottom. And, I, and as I sit there doing that, I think, you know, you're wasting time writing music, but, but I realize... No, because there's something about, I need the house to be clean before good ideas can enter. And I think that doesn't make any logical sense. 
but it, I end up cleaning the house before I do any writing. So, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. I've, I've never gotten applause for house cleaning ever before, so it's the first. But, so, but, so I have, part, one of my goals of my life is to keep my life managed in a way that helps me be creative. And that, that one sentence, sets up a huge number of things that I'd rather not do. <laughs> but I've learned that, there is the, the, that the opposite is just not productive for my creative life. So, um, so I have goals in the other, and I have, I have a husband who I've been with 12 years and I love very much and I, thank you, thank you so much. And he's, he's the most patient person in the world. And so I really treasure his patience with me and so I know that I need to honor that as well. So that's an example of a goal. And, um, and that's not a professional goal, but oh my gosh, does it relate to my creativity and my profession? 100%. So anyway, I think I answered. <laughs> well, I'm finishing a novel, so now I have to go home and clean my house. Yes, I recommend it. <laughs> well, we have time for one last question. And, um, Technically, this gentleman came up first, you know, before Slido, so we're going to go over here. Maybe if I, maybe if, if I wasn't if so talkative, talks quickly, we we'll could get you too. both. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, sure. I just want to say hi to you from my younger brother, Blake. He's a violinist, and he's just obsessed with all your music. Oh, gotcha. um, but my question was, as a musician and a person, how do you go about deciding what you need for your soul, especially when you're pursuing a career in music, like being in conservatory when you have a certain you know, degree in mind that you're intended to go for, but you know, the soul requires a lot of different things. So how do you decide what other things in your life you want to pursue and go for when you're, you know, just be going about life? I guess? Well, you have to listen to your own soul. Like that's where the answer is, you know? I, I don't feel like, I, I never get to decide what my soul needs. It always tells me, <laughs> like house cleaning, for example, I, don't, I wouldn't decide that, but that's the thing I learned that my soul needs. So. Um, and I need to have, a, um, I, a, that sounds like a flippant answer, but it's not meant to be. If you're, in the, if you're practicing four hours a day, or six hours, or eight, and you're miserable, then I would say, is that, are, are you temporarily miserable because you're toward a certain goal? When I'm on a film and there's a deadline, I'm not a happy guy, <laughs> all right? But there's a goal. And I know that it's for the goal, and the goal is worth it, and so I've done that. But if you're that way all the time, and, and the goal doesn't light you up, then I would say you need to listen to your soul, because ultimately, life, you know, the, you, you have to be a happy person, and you have to nurture your soul, and there you go. Thank you so much. Sure. Appreciate it. We have two... No, I, I, think I won't we, push we, it. No, 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 that was great because I, I heard the titles of like five different books, Listen to oh, Your awesome. Soul and Great. I, I'm writing these things down. So. I wanted to interview you after your oh, no. inter, inter, intro. I'm like so interested. Um, but the last question is going to be mine because as I'm listening to you talk about your music, the words and, and the, the spirit of what you're saying are so amazing. Do you write words rather than music anytime? And would you write something like a book or a memoir or? Gosh, well, thanks. Well, my, I, I occasionally write, like the songs that uh, were mentioned in my intro, um, did I write the, yeah, I wrote the words for those. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> so I, 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 I do that, but I, um, I also enjoy collaborating with writers, like with, um, on the Kronos piece, I'm collaborating with Nikki Finney, who's mm -hmm. a, yes. yeah, right? Yes. <laughs> Lucky me, she's a, she's a poet, she's a National Book Award winner, and I'm setting her text, and then with um, the opera, Rhiannon is writing, the, because she's a songwriter, right? So she's writing the libretto. Wow. And so I'm very happy to, to assist her in helping go from being a songwriter to being an opera composer, so. Well, I think there's a book in you. Well, thank so you. I just want to say, I think it's a huge, listening from to a, From a, an author, that's a huge compliment, thank you. Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Abel. Thank you.
<laughs> this is such a great community we have here. Sphinx is just an amazing community. If you're, if you're first time here, welcome. I hope you're here for your life. And just before we close out our, our closing plenary, thank you, you were both so incredible. This is really moving and touching and inspiring to all of us. But before we go party and celebrate, I have something very special to share. Michael was kind enough to, to bring and share with us 30 CDs of his soundtrack from us. But don't get all excited for a second. So the first 30 people to submit a unique idea for a session topic or a session format for next year's Sphinx Connect will receive such a copy of a CD. So and get to it. <laughs> they're autographed. So they're, they're spectacularly valuable and special. So get to it. And with that, let's give a last round of applause and then proceed to, uh, to a party. Amazing. It's so beautiful.